is being presented by one from where I guess it's fair to say all of this started. Uh, Professor Blockwell described some of the historical events at the Fritz Haber Institute where the work was started. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Davis for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it's especially a pleasure to have Dr. Farkas here, and I hope he will remind some of the places where he worked more than 59 years ago. First slide. I will report. Shall I do this or will you? <laughs> okay, fine. Some of the important early work in gas reaction kinetics, including the preparation of para-hydrogen, was performed in the former Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physical Chemistry and Electrochemistry, which now is the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Gesellschaft. Next slide, please. The institute was founded 1911 with the generous help of the industrialist Leopold Koppel. It was situated in the outskirts of Berlin, in the city district of Dahlem. You see the old institute on the left hand side, the Institute of Chemistry. This is the place where Otto Hahn observed the first atomic fission, where the atomic age began. And this is the Institute for Physical Chemistry and Electrochemistry. The foundation of this institute was such an important event that His Majesty, next slide, Kaiser Wilhelm himself came and joined when the institute was inaugurated on the 23rd October of 1912. The institute was built for its director, namely for Fritz Haber. Next slide. This is the institute as it looked 1913. The next slide will now show for the Haber. This is um, a color picture which was presented by Haber when he left Karlsruhe in 1912. It's a painting by Karl Trübner. This is Fritz Haber when he came to Dahlem. And I will show another picture of Fritz Haber which you can see in our institute. This is um, a memorial plaque with a bronze relief and an obituary citation which was written by Max von Lauer, 1934. It says, in history, Themistocles will not be remembered for being banished from the Persian king's court, but as a hero, hero of Salamis. Haber will go down in history as the ingenious discoverer of a process to combine nitrogen with hydrogen, based on the technical production of nitrogen from the atmosphere. He will be remembered in words set at his Nobel Prize presentation as the man who through his technique through his technique helped the progress of agricultural development and as a result increase the standard of living for millions of people. He made bread out of air and gained a triumph for his country and mankind. Between these two pictures, there was a brilliant time in the Dahlem Institute. 
there were the so-called golden pens. The historical events, also leading to today's discussion, began early in the decennium and ended abruptly in 1933, when the institute was depleted by the Nazi government. Before discussing all the parahydrogen, a few presented slides to characterize the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute during the golden 20s. Next slide shows Fritz Haber and Albert Einstein. In the, they had been friends and they are photographed here in the stairway of our institute. When Haber set up two other departments, behind his own, Herbert Freundlich, next slide, who had been working at the Institute since 1916, became deputy director. He headed the Department of Colloid Chemistry, a field of which he was one of the founders. In 1923, a second department of physical chemistry was established. Next slide, please. <coughs> this is um, Michael Polani, who was head of the uh, second department of physical chemistry. Another department of atomic physics was directed by James Frank. Next slide. Here he continued his work on electron atom collision, for which he, together with Gustav Hertz, was awarded <coughs> with the Nobel Prize in 1925. This is a picture that was taken our institute when James Frank left for Göttingen. You see James Frank, Lisa Meitner, Otto Hahn, Fritz Haber, Gustav Hertz. Albert Einstein, people who all worked at that time in Dahlia. The scientific situation in the Dahlia time, in the golden years, golden twenties, may be further characterized by a slide, next slide please, which show five people discussing. Each of them has the Nobel Prize. Ernst, Einstein, Planck, Max von Lauer, who was director of our institute after the war, and Müller, who was just visiting the institute at that time. And now I will give a view, bird's eye view of Dahlem of that time. Or the Kaiser Wilhelm. It was chemistry, this is physical chemistry. And there was a famous place, the Harnack House. It was a guest house of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, where all the famous discussions occurred, where they had the witness the colloquium of Fritz Haber. Now let's turn over to the discovery of para and auto hydrogen. How it all started with the para and auto hydrogen. Arnold Eucken found, found an unexpected behavior of hydrogen in 1912. Next slide, please. Walter Ernst, who was his boss, reported about the work of his co-worker Eucken in the Königlich Preußische Akademie der Wissenschaft. This was a place where new results were discussed. The topic was heat capacity of hydrogen at low temperatures. The result of Eucken's experiments was that the heat capacity, the mole wärme, next slide please, at const, mole wärme at constant pressure, neither followed the predictions of the Planck-Einstein relation, nor the nernst lindemann model. The heat capacity increased much slower with temperature than predicted. Thus, Eucken had developed a hypothesis of a special elastic force between the hydrogen atoms which could explain the phenomenon but which was not convincing even to him. 
more than 15 years passed until these experimental observations were explained with the application of a wave mechanics which in the meantime had been developed by Schrödinger and Heisenberg. David Dennison published a paper in 1927, the Proceedings of the Royal Society, referring to an article by Friedrich Hund, which treated the specific heat of hydrogen molecules on the basis of wave mechanics. The total number of rotational states are divided due to the homopolar character of the molecule into two groups, to one of which belong wave functions of symmetrical and two nuclei, and the other wave functions which are antisymmetrical in nuclei. Hund was, has suggested that the presence of both groups in hydrogen may be accounted for by assuming that the nuclei possess a spin, in which case transitions between symmetrical or between antisymmetrical states will have their usual intensity, but transitions between symmetrical and antisymmetrical states will be very weak. With this assumption, general features of the hydrogen spectra could be described. However, however a careful analysis of ultraviolet bands of hydrogen gave arguments which led Dennison to the conclusion that there are two modifications of hydrogen which do not exchange inter se and which consist of one antisymmetrical species which is at room temperature three times as numerous as the symmetrical one. This was all theoretical prediction. This problem received much attention and the experimental proof for the hydrogen modifications became one of the most interesting tasks of that time. Among those competing were Arnold Eucken, co-worker of Nernst, and with his co-workers Hiller and Clusius, they were all in Breslau, and the other Karl Friedrich Bonhoeffer and Paul Hartek. Bonhoeffer and Hartek must be in the 20s, late 20s. They worked in the Kaiser Wilhelm Zitlendale. This is a picture of the two young scientists who were first to prepare pure parahydrogen, which they identified by heat conductivity. The results were published in Die Naturwissenschaft, 1929. There was just one sentence which caused a sensation in Bonnefer Hartek's paper. This sentence says, by absorbing hydrogen on coal at temperature of liquid hydrogen, one can obtain practically pure parahydrogen. On the same page, of the 1929 issue of Naturwissenschaften was a communication by Arnold Eucken, the competitor. He reported that his co-worker Hiller had studied parahydrogen formation for several months. They used high pressure cells and found a slow reaction towards parahydrogen 10 times higher than the statistical mean error. A result much less spectacular than Bonhoeffer and Hartex. Eucken was one of the editors of the Naturwissenschaften and therefore he managed to publish his results quickly so they appeared on the same page of the journal. <laughs> the success of Bonhoeffer and Hartek, obviously, was the fortune of the talents. There was no reason for them to predict that charcoal would catalyze the transition towards parahydrogen. They just used charcoal 
to remove organic impurities from the hydrogen. The scientific world was very impressed by these two modifications of hydrogen, which gave excellent proof for the newly established quantum mechanics. A very busy time ensued with the, with the aim to understand the properties of these modifications and the mechanism of their transformation. In this work, the Farkas brothers, Ladislav Farkas and Alabel Farkas, were actively involved. The next picture shows them working up their way in their career. <laughs> On the upper left, Hartek, and we see Bonhoeffer and Ladislav Alvin. This paper was taken early 30s, I think. Many interesting events and successful work of the future years are documented in an excellent article by Adebelt Farkas from the ACS Symposium, 1982. It would be presumptuous of me to comment on this. I just would like to show two more pictures from that time. Fritz Haber, Ladislav Farkas, Hartek, um, Goldfinger. These are people who have been on the Seewasser action. Seawasser, seawater commission. Next shows Fritz Haber, Ladislav Farkas, Goldfinger. Excuse me, who was the last one? Goldfinger. He oh, was in okay. he was in Brussels. Then I would like to add two things from that time. The first came to my attention recently when I found a handwritten letter of Karl Friedrich Bonhoeffer written when he was already appointed professor for physical chemistry in Frankfurt. Next slide, please. Adalbert Farkas joined him to Frankfurt as an assistant professor. This letter was written to Professor Haber and Dahlem and concerned the non-dissociative mechanism, the paramagnetic mechanism of conversion. Ladislav Farkas and Sachse, who stayed in Berlin at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, had found a simple conversion by adding molecular oxygen. Due to the magnetic moment of oxygen molecule, it catalyzed the conversion. Karl Friedrich Bonhoeffer was somehow jealous when this was brought to his attention. He wrote to Harbour, I translate, the results by Farkas and Sachse really impressed us here in Frankfurt. And we are a little bit ashamed that we could not find them ourselves after nearly three years' endeavor to elucidate the conversion mechanism of the two hydrogen modifications. Apparently, we have forgotten to take our experimental luck with us when we left Dahlem. <laughs> the other point which I would like to mention is the enormous impact which this one published work by Adabelt Farkas, next slide, had on the development of chemical dynamics. Kinetik der thermischen Umwandlung von Parawasserstoff. Adabelt Farkas, 1970. Farkas found that the rate equation for this reaction had to be described by a hydrogen pressure dependence with an exponent of 1.5. Very simple. At temperatures of 
600 Celsius thermally dissociated atomic hydrogen was reacting with parahydrogen molecule like this one. And the transition could be observed. The rate and the activation energy of this reaction could be determined. It was this simple reaction which attracted the attention of theoreticians. Michael Poulain and Henry Eyring. Henry Eyring was a visiting scientist in Dahlem in 1929-30. They used Fritz London's adiabatic approach. And in their famous paper, next slide please, in 1930, Über einfache Gasreaktion. They used this to, to, to <coughs> calculate the first energy hypersurface for this chemical reaction, which they called Resonanzgebirge. This was the beginning of a new field of science, the dynamics of chemical reactions. When there was an international meeting at the Fritz Haber Institute, on account of the 50s anniversary of this work, Henry Eyring, who was invited but could not attend, wrote a note about his reminiscences of his time in Berlin. Henry Eyring, he died at the end of this year. He reports that originally he did not intend to go to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, but tried to work with Max Bodenstein for a year. But he learned that Bodenstein would not be in Berlin at that envisaged time. This was awkward. walk. So he, he decided to, to uh, do something else. Occasionally he discussed with Frumpkin. Frumpkin proposed to go to Polanyi and work together with Polanyi in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Iron remembered from that time in Berlin, it was not uncommon to see up to eight Nobel laureates at the science meeting in the Harnack House of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. The meeting 50 years of dynamics of chemical reactions, which was held at the Fritz Haber Institute, gave an excellent cross-section of the development of this area. Yun Ti Li and John C. Polanyi, Michael Polanyi's son, both chemistry Nobel Prize winners in 1986, were contributing. The work of our Fritz Haber Institute was presented by Gehard Abdes, work on chemical dynamics in surface reactions. In order to give some, <coughs> present some efforts of the Fritz Haber Institute of today's scientific problems, which are concerned to characterize the state-to-state -state dynamic of surface reactions, I picked up one problem I would like to characterize, <coughs> present activities at the Fritz Haber Institute by picking up again Adalbert Farkas's reaction between atomic and molecular hydrogen. This reaction was recently investigated in a surface process on the atomic scale in a field eye microscope with mass spectrometer the so-called atom probe. We are interested to learn about this reaction on the surface. And I will show in a few slides that this intermediate H3, which also has a special history, can be identified. You can see that we have a stable H3 molecular species on the surface, a very curious molecule which we can identify. We do this by applying field iron microscopic techniques. The next slide shows the inventor of the field iron microscope, Erwin Müller. He saw the first field iron images 1950 in our institute before he left for the United States. One can study surface reactions on the atomic scale, next slide, 
if one is using fifth-eye images. This is the million times magnification of a surface, and each spot represents a certain atom. From this we can characterize the crystallographic position of different places. This image is formed in the field ion microscope, and we will apply this to the reaction of hydrogen. The uh, energetics of different molecules in the hydrogen system is given by a <coughs> theoretical calculation, a initial calculation, coming also from John Polanyi's school. Maybe, or Zygmunt is another group. If we calculate the energy when we put three protons and three electrons together, then we find the most stable modification is a molecular hydrogen and an atom. But only 200 milli electron volts less stable is the H3, the stretched line. And so <coughs> there is only a small energy gap between H3 and the hydrogen molecule and atom. Actually, Herzberg, in 1979, has seen this modification also in an electronically excited state. So it exists in an electronically excited state. We are looking to this particle on the surface, and I will show you that we can demonstrate that it must be a stretched neutral, and that the lifetime of such a particle is the order of at least 100 microseconds. Next slide shows how we do this. We have our surface on the field emitter, and we have hydrogen adsorbed on the surface. Now, <coughs> we dissolve particles by field desorption. We have to put on a field on the order of one volt per angstrom in order to polarize and ionize particles from the surface in the field annihilation process. If we have hydrogen at low temperatures, by field forces, we also can absorb molecular hydrogen. <coughs> Between hydrogen atoms and chemical hydrogen atoms and molecular hydrogens, we form an H3 neutral. And this H3 neutral can be desorbed and measured in a mass spectrometer. Next slide shows a mass spectrometer signal. This, we have here field strengths. And here's the intensity of different species. And we put hydrogen on a metal surface, like tungsten, or iridium, or niobium or so. We see that besides H2, which starts to be field ions dissolved at these field strings, we find the H hydrogen atom, and we find the H3 plus signal. And with this H3 plus signal, we can make experimental try how it depends on temperature, material, and also see how the energy distribution of these particles looks like. This is another technique which I would like to explain just shortly. If we have, next slide please. <coughs> Since we have a very steep voltage drop in front of a surface, we can measure the origin of ions by measuring the energy distribution. This is the energy distribution measured, measured data for a neon atom. And on the same side of the surface, we measure the H3. This is measured potential of origin. If we have a potential dependence, knowledge about potential dependence, we can change this over and give data on distances of surface. This is one angstrom, two angstrom, three angstrom. The precision is better than a tenth of an angstrom. You can say that a particle comes directly from the surface or a tenth or one angstrom in front of this. Next slide shows this as an example. We have again our surface here. We have the neon atom. With the neon atom, we measure the energy distribution. This is some kind of energy distribution of neon. We know neon, the energy distribution has to do with the radius of the neon atom. If we increase temperature, the energy distribution is getting much broader because there's vibration. 
we can take this as a <coughs> standard for our energy distance determination. And when we measure this for the hydrogen, as was seen in the image before, then we can see that the distance where the iron is ionized must be the top atom of a tri-mere triatomic hydrogen molecule. We again have electron impact desorption of these and we have laser pulse desorption of these species which give us information about the lifetime so we can say lifetime must be of this data at least 100 microseconds and the structure of the neutral is a stretched molecule H3. Next slide. Show this again. This is the immediate which we measure where we can by electro impact or by laser pulse dissolve this particle and measure H3 plus. So this is just one example. We are trying to demonstrate that this old reaction, which is 1930, was of interest still is something which with quite different scientific questions gives us possibility to contribute to fundamental questions in surface reaction dynamics. This is a kind of work that is going on in the Fritz Haber Institute. Next slide, please. And these days, and we have also energy hyperphases calculated. We can, this is done by Kreutzer and Halifax, who is an external member of our institute. And we can say that the hydrogen under these conditions, under field influence, is must be a stretched up standing molecular species that the distance and the upper surfaces of this system. Next slide. This is the institute these days. The next one, the old building still. This is the Kaiser entrance. This was an entrance in the Kaiser, the inaugurated the institute, and at the institute end, which is now a laboratory. The door was closed immediately after the inauguration of Next slide. Shall we the Institute of the home of Wilstedt, who was at Dahl at the time. And this is a new institute here, which was built for Ernst Doska, who had his electromicroscopic department there. And then the yeah, last one, the new computer center. You see the style of buildings is at least getting different. but. It's a marvelous place to work there, and we are also proud of the history which this place has.